Hi, my name is Patricia Kathleen, and this podcast series will contain interviews I conduct with women, female-identified, and non-binary individuals regarding their professional stories and personal narrative as it relates to their perspective. This podcast is designed to hold a space for all individuals to learn from their counterparts, regardless of age, status, or industry. We intend to transparently investigate the evolving global dialogue regarding underrepresented figures in all industries across the USA and abroad. By hosting these stories and conversations, we aim to contribute to the changing platform and representation of these individuals for the future. Now let's start the conversation. Hi, everyone, and welcome back. I am your host, Patricia, and today I'm sitting down with Eva Chan. Eva is the co-founder of LaunchPop. Uh, The website is www.launchpop.com. Welcome, Eva. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, I'm excited to climb through what you do. I like the idea of talking to um, someone who's kind of in the the very trenches of branding and um, communications and things like that that you guys do. For everyone listening, I will read a quick bio on Eva before I start peppering her with questions. But prior to that, a quick roadmap for today's podcast. It will follow the same trajectory as all of those in this particular series. Namely, we will start by unpacking and taking a quick view of Eva's uh, academic background and early professional life that brought her to the launch of um, Launch Pop. And then we will get into um, some of the particulars and unpacking the ethos of LaunchPop itself and um, the the services it offers, the clientele it looks at. Then we'll turn towards um, the logistics as well as the ethos and the philosophy behind that company. And then we'll wrap everything up with looking at goals and advice that Eva may have for those of you looking to um, kind of get involved or work with her on any different level. A quick bio on Eva. Eva and her team at LaunchPop help high potential founders launch brands that change our lives. From new categories to disrupting them, founders can find themselves partnering with LaunchPop to build a company that is not only backed by science, but also fueled by passion and community. As an ex-operator and co-founder to high growth startups, Eva has now developed a framework that is now shared with founders so that they can launch their company with a strategy that is inclusive of design, marketing, community, and finance. She was named Forbes 30 under 30 in 2017 in marketing. So that's really impressive. I think that's exciting. And um, it's cool to have someone like Forbes take notice of you under 30. Those are hard categories to get into. Um, I want to, before we launch into talking about all of that and some of the endeavors that landed you with that mm-hmm. Forbes title, I'm hoping you can offer everyone a quick background of your academic life and like early professional life that led you to the launch of Launch Pop. Wow. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so I'm actually originally trained as an illustrator. Um, I knew nothing about business, finance, um, and I went to uh, an to OCAD University, which is kind of like the Parsons in Canada, mm-hmm. um, and studied illustrations, four-year program, um, and I think it was in my third year, uh, I woke up, you know, going to my 9.30 class, you know, I've been painting for, I don't know, like 13 hours, my eyes were bloodshot, I've been tearing from painting the details, um, and I realized I can't do this. <laughs> I will yeah. never make enough money for all the hours I spend um, on one piece and the industry isn't moving towards that anymore. Um, it's becoming more digital. And so I actually, uh, that day I I walked to another campus, um, another whole like college, uh, it's business college that's right beside us. And I, I just walked into a classroom and they were talking about finance. Uh, I had no idea what they were talking about, but I was really excited. Um, to have snuck into this class and kind of yeah. out into a different world. And I, I felt like for, for many years, I was in my own circle, just thinking about design and uh, art, um, but realizing, you know, you have to know more than that. Um, if you start your own, you know, freelance doing design, you still need to understand business. Mm-hmm. Um, fortunately, you know, the school I was in wasn't heavily teaching that side of it. Um, and so I think that's where it all started. Uh, I had a bit of an epiphany. 
uh, got involved with some of the student groups in the campuses beside us um, and literally offered my skill set as a designer to like build posters and then in exchange let me be part of the workshops to learn about business and I remember there was a talk um, done by a founder back then and that was like the start of like the word startup the, the word entrepreneurship this was a long time ago <laughs> yeah do you remember what year it was oh man like seven years ago um 2013 or 14 yeah, somewhere where like Shopify didn't exist, you know, building yeah. a, as eight developers on the team. Um, and so this founder, he was actually uh, building a beauty subscription box. Um, it was the first one in Canada. The, the competitor in U.S. was I think Glossy Box or Birch Box um, at the time. And um, I was the, the first female on the team. <laughs> and wow. nice. company was eight male developers uh, trying to sell cosmetic memberships. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so that was really the start of my career, I think, um, being a designer in the team. Uh, and you know, the nature of being part of a startup, you have to wear multiple hats. Um, so not only was I just designing email campaigns, uh, designing the experience of the, uh, the unboxing, uh, thinking about product, what should be part of it, you know, there's like four to five samples in it. So how can we be, you know, very diverse in the products we offer? Um, and then jumping into, uh, you know, the boardroom, you know, the, the quarterly meetings and being exposed to finance and um, sale targets and whatnot. Yeah. And it's funny because I didn't understand any of it back then. I didn't know what margin meant. <laughs> What's right. the profit and revenue and <laughs> yeah. but it's have growth month over month um and so I would write down all these words in my notebook and I spent my time in those meetings just writing all the things I did not understand um mm -hmm. and then offline I would go on google <laughs> and literally search up all those terms um and finally over time you know quarter after quarter I began to develop my own thoughts um, during mm -hmm. those meetings. And uh, one, one time I, I had the courage to say something um, about what was happening. And um, at the end of that meeting, you know, uh, my, the manager or CEO at the time emailed me and said, hey, you should speak up more um, because your, your thoughts are valuable. Um, and that was the start of me really thinking critically and he gave me a ton of confidence to speak more um, and permission to like think outside of my domain. Um, and I think uh, after that, everything changed. The company sold uh, to a competitor and then uh, we formed the next company, which was Exact Media, uh, which is my previous company before LaunchPop. We were four co-founders um and i was no longer a designer on the team i was actually driving new revenue streams for the company um and by myself uh thinking of you know bd opportunities uh product ideas how do we automate uh certain things create products to increase our revenue streams um so over the course of three to four years i was launching nonstop. Every yeah. quarter, launching something um, by myself, and if I needed help, I get contractors. Um, I think that was really the start of this obsession to launch. Um, and then, so story about Exact Media. You know that company was a rocket ship. Um, we we grew from four team members to fifty in literally less than a year and a half. Um, wow. That funny wow. you know, year. Um, we were in Cincinnati, New York, Toronto. You can imagine like the growth pains, culture pains from, you know, growing, shrinking, growing, shrinking, replacing people with different skill sets, uh, more experience. Really. Now, is this the company that was acquired eventually by the competitor? Um, so the beauty box description company was oh, right. competitor. Exact yeah. meeting actually last, uh, last November or December, we were acquired by another agency in, in the UK. Um, so that just happened. 
Um, but yeah, anyhow, like for me, the company was doing really well and just quick background what it is. It's a sampling program. We just took what we did really well in the, the beauty box company and translated into something that, you know, we knocked off all the stuff that we're not good at and just kept all the things that we're really good at, which was good. Uh, building relationships with big brands um, and um, samples. <laughs> we really understood sampling. Yeah. Um, and so instead of uh, all the bad stuff for holding inventory, shipping, cold packing, um, those were the things we didn't want. And so Black Media was a brokerage company for large brands like L'Oreal, P&G, and we took their samples and placed them into e-commerce parcels of Guilt.com, Ulala, um, and we were able to circle back with a lot of data for these big brands. Um, and otherwise, they wouldn't be able to collect data because of the way they did it was events or street sampling. Um, so that company was doing really well, you know, like financially sound. And um, but I think I realized something again. <laughs> like yeah. life can't just be about making money, and um, it has to have some purpose behind it. Um, or else, you know, like you're not feeding your soul. Um, and when you're not feeding your soul, it eats at you. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I think I felt that. And uh, that's when I started to uh, think about, you know, what I want to do, uh, what I enjoyed and what's next. Um, so in my evenings, you know, like from like five to nine, um, I, I would meet a lot of other founders who needed help, like, uh, a single founder who, you know, had a great idea, but just didn't know what to do next. Um, and so we would just, you know, go over coffee. And I, I realized I get really excited about their ideas. I get really excited talking to them. Um, and that's, that's, you know, when I realized I, I want to help people. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I want to help them, you know, in this very, very scary moment you know, this scary stage of the company where there is, there's an idea, there's a passion, but then it, the, the path to launching is very ambiguous, it's very chaotic. Um, and I think I, I, I did it so much <laughs> in my past, like seven years of my life that it's become a bit of a science for me. Um, and I wanted to shed that uh, learning and playbook to other people. Absolutely. And I think that is a time period when it's still considered to be like this wild west. And you saying that it's kind of a science for you is mm -hmm. very um, comforting for people who have this, you know, this moment. If you get online, if you Google right now launching a brand mm -hmm. or, you know, your company, there are 50,000 different ways to do it. And there are experts that will tell you the exact opposite of one another and they both have good reasons, but it can be incredibly frenetic in what is already a frenetic time. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that you have this like um, confidence and this basis of foundation that feels like it's very rote to you, it's very scientific, it's something you're familiar and comfortable with is, is so unique. And I suspect that we're now getting into the story of LaunchPop and, um, and the background of it. Can you kind of speak to um, well, first, I want to say the slogan, if you hit the website, if you get on um, www.launchpop.com, it's very clean. It's a minimalist site and comes across um, to me as that you're very into very succinct um, services, right? That's how I received it as um, someone who's hit over a billion websites in the past couple of years. <laughs> I'm a prolific researcher and I've had my hands in a lot of things, but that's how it's met. And I like the idea of that, particularly when you're looking at branding agencies and people like that, if you hit a website presence that's very cluttered or confusing, I immediately think they're already confusing. They're never going to clarify or crystallize me. So yeah. I think that that's your presence. And then um, you have this statement that says, we launch brands that change the way we live. Mm -hmm. And so I want to kind of unpack that as you begin to tell the story of launch pop that particular statement can be interpreted in a couple of different ways and i want to know what it means to you yeah for sure i mean um as a marketer you're offering a service and the service for us is helping you go from zero to one right um that 
that itself can be applied to any industry, any stage of a company. You're always launching something, you know, you're always launching an idea, launching a campaign, launching a new product. Um, but um, we realize, you know, this is a very special power, a very special skill set. Um, and we want to make sure we are, you know, applying this skill set to where it matters, at least for us. Um, and we think, you know, this skill set matters to products that actually change the way we live um, or shaping our culture and making it better. Um, so uh, in order to do this, we need to understand who we're helping. Um, and who it is right now, we're not going to, I'm not, I don't want to say I understand Gen Z, uh, <laughs> um, but we really understand millennials and the way we, you know, vet founders, vet products and say what we're really good at is that we're really good at building um, products and life improvements for the millennial. Um, and what we do at LaunchPop is we just follow the millennials journey. This is he or she in their thirties, you know, what's top of mind for them. Um, you know, like young families, young mommies, uh, they care about anti-aging right now, they care about their finances, they care about quality, right? Um, they care about their health. And so if you think about, about that, just that itself, a lot of products and services come out of it. For example, anti-aging and skincare, um, stress, anxiety management, um, there could be, you know, like finance apps, for example, that help you save money to buy a home. Um, there could be a lot of products that um, help young mommies, for example. And so that's how we think about it. When we uh, launch new products that change your life, we want to help that millennial uh, do like think differently, uh, be educated, um, and be empowered to make better choices. And That's interesting. So is it a niche population that you deal with? Are you best suited to help brands that have application towards millennials? Because it sounds like you have these filters where if a brand came to you or a launch brand and was saying, here's what I've got, you're like, these are the different um, subjects that we've kind of parsed out that we can apply lenses to with your brand and kind of educate and introduce it into that area. But it is within the stipulation of millennials as opposed to Gen Z or even Gen I, which you can now market to just yeah. as equally, you know? Yeah, I mean, like you, to your point, you know, when you go to an agency site um, and there's so much going on, uh, you don't know if what they're really good at, right? And I don't want to pretend that I know everything. Um, I, I'm very happy to tell someone that I don't know how to do this. This is not where you should go for, for that. Um, but if you are trying to solve a problem for a millennial um, in the e-commerce space, uh, it could be something physical, it could be something that's a service community driven, then we can help. Um, I just want to be very clear about what I can do and uh, what I can't do. Yeah. So do you launch, that was my next question. I feel like you're kind of a products based um, enterprise. Do you help launch brands, personal brands, people, um, for instance, podcasts, you know, they're the number one taking off form of marketing and media across all platforms globally. Could you help a podcaster launch their brand? Uh, you mean like their personal brand as a podcaster? For example? Yeah, I mean, I think what I'm getting at is do you service people better who have an actual tangible physical product? Or can you also launch personal brands? I mean, the, the marriage between personal brands and service or product is now like in full fledged. Even if you have a Frisbee, someone wants to know the founder of it. They the micro influencers, right? They want to know the backstory. How did you come into it? Why are you doing Frisbees? What's special about your Frisbee? What's special about your founder? Like yada, yada, yada. This is the new wave of marketing. Yeah. And so I'm wondering because those are blended anyway, it's like blended with a personal brand strategist. Do you tend to always gravitate towards objects or physical products? Yeah, so um, I don't want to say I gravitate towards a product, um, but I want to drill it down to what we believe in how to build a brand um, mm -hmm. and a very early stage brand. Uh, it could be a product or a person. It could be a can, uh, an app for example but we believe in you know when you're new to this world and you're sharing a whole new uh, way of thinking uh, you have to build community and you have to build trust um, right and so that's the basis of what we do um, 
if you're building a podcast brand, uh, you need a community. We're really good at building communities. Um, if you're building a, a new product that goes to market, we always suggest to build your community before you even have the product. Let's get a community going so you have, you know, another data point to to understand what flavors to launch first. Um, another data point on if your product tastes good or not um, before you go to market. Let's have a beta group, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really key point. And it's one that people kind kind of miss if you're not focused or you're having someone help you focus. People can say, I've got, you know, 500,000 Instagram followers, but is it the community that is based around what you're trying to launch? Exactly. Yeah, I think you're completely right. And it's very interesting to kind of parse that out. I think you would need a third party such as yourself. Okay, let's unpack some of the logistics of LaunchPot. So when was it founded? Who are all of the founders? And did you receive any funding? Okay, so we concepted LaunchPot, I want to say three years ago, 2017. Um, and it all started with our friend, um, Sun back in San Francisco. He reached out to Jane and I because he knew that we were diving into a partnership together, but didn't know what to launch together. And he said, hey, I went to Korea and I got this brown bottle. Um, everyone drinks this uh, because they like to drink, hang out, and then go back to work strong. Um, but I don't understand why this does not exist in America. And so he said, hey, try it. Let me know what you think. Um, and can you guys launch it for me? Because he understood that my co-founder, Jane, was, you know, B-school, Czech, um, brand manager of CPG companies, and she's a great marketer. Um, and for me, I'm a launcher, per se, designer, marketer. And so uh, that was really the start of LaunchPop. Um, a friend coming to us for help in Jane and I, there's only two co-founders. Uh, we decided to, let's try this out. Why not just test out our partnership, you know, uh, test if, you know, what we know today is even worth it for people to pay us. <laughs> yeah. um, and so in our evenings from like five to one, uh, we were more energetic at night. <laughs> and for six months, we started building this brand, um, which is our very, very first company, the morning recovery drink at the time. Uh, we launched it on Product Hunt, and um, it was trending overnight. Um, investors uh, got really interested in this product because we positioned it like a tech uh, tool, um, productivity hack. Um, and, and then uh, press was really interested in, in featuring this hangover drink. Mm. Uh, and so that was really interesting. That was the start of a beta group, actually. So everyone who was interested on the page asking questions, we said, hey, join our beta group. We launched that on Facebook. We had over 300 users. Um, and that was the beginning of season, you know, testing out all the flavors. We created a whole science experiment. Um, the, the flavor, they were all packed in these like white jars and it was really ghetto, but everyone knew the cause was for the sake of science. Yeah. Um, and, uh, that was happening and then when we launched on Indiegogo, all of those users that were in the community were waiting for for their chance to buy and so we actually converted a, a large number of these members to uh, support us in the Indiegogo campaign um, and as a result in our first hour we raised over $150,000 um, and that was nice. the, the start of launch pop um, we started getting emails in um, from everywhere, from um, New York, LA, some international. Um, and I always tell people, you know, our emails were something at gmail.com. We didn't even have a company yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. Well, I mean, you did what you said you do for your clients now. You developed a community. And, mm -hmm. you know, when you have that, the website and things of that nature can very well come later. There's a huge oh, sure. advocate arm out there for entrepreneurs and founders where people are like, do not get hung up on having the most polished website in the world. Like if your idea is ready and your work is done, get going. That stuff can come later. Exactly. Because you don't have data points to make the perfect site. There's no such thing. Um, you need to put it out there, collect data, tweak, collect data, tweak. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so now I didn't, I didn't catch it. Is it two other co-founders or yourself and Jane? Uh, it's just myself and Jane. Okay. 
Um, and that makes sense. And how many full-time employees do you have right now? So we have about 10. They're all remote um, in Toronto, LA, San Francisco. Um, and we've been remote since day one. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. As well, you should be. You know, I think <laughs> anyone who's providing an online service when they have an office, I'm like, to play why? ping pong? Like, why are you doing that? To hang out and have pizza? I mean, I love to chill and hang out with people, but um, to pay rent for it just seems silly. It's yeah. how many people are still doing it too. Mm -hmm. um, did you, so, and you didn't take any funding from the sound of it. It was just you and Jane kind of cranking it out. Yeah, it's interesting. Our first year was a disaster. You know, we didn't make any money because we had to figure out a model that made sense for working with early stage founders who are so bootstrapped. Um, and for us to, you know, be able to sustain ourselves and hire talent that was uh, really good on the team. Um, and so we were in this phase where we we're testing different markets, models, testing, you know, getting equity, testing, getting revenue share, um, a reach, retainer. Um, and then in the end, you know, we were at this point where, you know, when you like really just need a bit of cash so you can hire your first few talent. Um, and so we went through during that period, you know, asking investors um, for an investment. Um, and they want, they were really curious about this because we would, it made a lot of sense. You know, we knew CPG companies, C to C, a lot of tech investors wanted to diversify their investment portfolio, but they didn't have the partners and deal flow to understand D to C and the right founders to invest in. And so we made sense to be an, an extension to their investment arm. And, and they for were, everyone, sorry to cut you off, making or Ava, really quickly, but, um, can you spell out those acronyms for people listening? DDC as well as? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah DTC is direct to consumer. Um, it's basically like an online business where you're shipping a physical product. Um, a lot of investors don't know this world, but it's becoming more and more interesting for them because there has been a lot of uh, great case studies of very large exits. Yeah, absolutely. So these people were curious, but what was the back the back part of that? Did they want more of the cookie than you wanted to give? Yeah, no. And, and then we started exploring, you know, different options too, um, in terms of getting cash. So, uh, you know, larger uh, corporate companies, finance companies were uh, wanting to uh, provide a loan. Um, and then in the end, um, Jane and I, you know, really evaluated what was really important for us short term and long term and uh, looked back to why we started this. Um, and we realized, you know, we need to have control. We need to have our freedom. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, we needed to be able to make the right decisions that uh, favored the founders um, and not ever to favor investors. Um, and so good for you. Those are hard decisions to make when money's on the line. Yeah. Very hard, um, because, uh, you know, if we can get investor investment, you know, the, the funds would be larger. Um, but at the very end of the day, we just went drilled it down to how much do you really need? Like to, to really get to just one step forward. Um, and all we needed was really to be comfortable and be vulnerable to ask people to borrow money. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, like all I did was I went to my brother and asked him for 20 K that was it. And that was the, ch the largest change and the biggest impact on launch pop today. It's amazing too, because, you know, you're reaching out to a lot of people would have anxiety to reaching out to investors and you had done all of that work. And at the end of the day, you were like, it's harder to reach in and actually be vulnerable and ask my sibling, which is fantastic. I think it's every time I heard the, I hear the term friends and family round, I get a pit in my stomach. And I know this is special just to myself. I've, you know, I've, I've built and um, sold several companies and I never did a friends and family round. And I think mm -hmm. it's a personal hang up but I have this like, oh, like I just would yeah. rather like not do it. You know, I'd rather do, like lose half my soul to an angel investor than, and I think it's just a personal thing. And so it's interesting to have, um, to have you say that it was yeah. like your last resort. Our friendships and family are so precious to us. You know, like I feel very scared more than myself feeling to fill them. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, looking forward, um, you've had kind of a great success after that rocky, as you call it, no salary first year. You guys have got a great stronghold now. Your presence of, you know, 10 people strong is awesome. Um, what do you, do you have goals and plans that you've mapped out for the next one to three years for your company? Yeah, I mean, um, the way we do goals at LaunchPop is very personal. Um, I never understood, you know, when a company says, you know, next year we need to hit 7 mil sales yeah. target. Why? Where is that coming from? Most of the time because there's an investor involved and you need to create, you know, the valuation for your company. Yeah. Um, we don't here at LaunchPop. And so that's why we kept the freedom because it's so precious to us. Um, the way we set goals is Jane and I, you know, sit in a room together or go on Zoom and talk about what do you want in three years in your life? Um, do you want a baby? Do you want a home? Um, let's be very honest too. Like, and there's no guilt here. Like, how much do you shop? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's be real and not fake this. Um, and when we paint out that life, and it, this is also inclusive of our team members. Um, we paint that life out and afterwards attach a dollar amount to it. What does that look like? Um, and you'll be surprised it doesn't cost that much a lot of times. Um, and so when we think about these goals and we attach a dollar amount to it, um, it, and then we reflect that, you know, back to us today and going forward, we, we have a very balanced lifestyle. We uh, are all happy because we're making the amount that will help us reach our goals um, and, and that's kind of on the finance side of things sales side of things but in terms of you know opportunities and strengthening our offering etc uh, we get a lot of opportunities coming our way um, like hey let's start like a, a joint venture together and partner up and launch like a cannabis arm of launching companies just for cannabis yeah. Um, let's start a company just to launch like beauty brands, for example, and it's funded by this like company, for example. Um, for us, we're really, really open to these ideas. Um, my thought is always let's test, let's just do a pilot, let's try it out. Um, but in the end, it has to strengthen the whole ecosystem. Um, so I love partnerships that help another, the whole thing. Whole, whole thing. <laughs> yes. So, for example, when we partner with investors, um, there's a mutual um, partnership here where when we partner with them, um, they get to see a lot of the great work that we do for founders. They get to, you know, get their first eye on uh, some of these founders who are looking for investment, right? And we're helping them with deal flow, qualifying the deal flow. And then on the founder side, you know, they love this as a perk because we understand what investors are thinking about. We can guide them in the right path so that they're ready to pitch, so that they can have a deck that is very effective, um, so that they know how to set goals, um, so that when they do start presenting to investors, they're already hitting some of those numbers that will get their attention. Um, other things like... Um, you know, like dinners, for example, you know, we love, you know, doing dinners that merge um, a lot of different industries together, for example, investors and then founders. Um, and then we have another agency folks. You know, there's a lot of stuff that we don't do from a marketing standpoint, for example, PR, then let's bring in the PR folks. Um, and let's have everyone help each other out. Absolutely. It sounds like a community effort. I like that idea of goal making as well and having it be more of a brainstorming session about one's life and what one wants to do to make them happy and then assigning a dollar amount to that. It's yeah. like a, a reverse twist on how insurance companies assign a value <laughs> to a human life. It, it like actually makes me happy, which I never thought I could kind of hear that, you know. It's cool to break it down and to find that it's not as expensive as one thinks. And those crazy amounts that people think of, like, and they put on their vision boards, like it's, you know, it's 18 million next year. I think you're right. They're founded by um, funders and, and people that don't have a lot of attachment to your happiness. And so the yeah. idea of flipping that on its head and making your goals directly attached to your happiness is so awesome. 
And it's crazy. People reach some of those crazy targets, you know, in those companies. Um, you know, they get their Series A, the next round, the next round, and then they go public, the IPO. Um, but they're not happy. Right. Yeah, exactly. It's completely delineated, which nobody wants to start their own endeavor and end up unhappy in the end. That's, yeah. There's never been a founder in the world that's like, at the end of this, I'm going to want to off myself. You know, that's just <laughs> not how it goes. Right. Um, I want to wrap everything up today with asking you about advice. And this is how I pitch it to everyone I speak with. Um, so if you were approached tomorrow on a direct message in one of your social media platforms that you use a lot by a young individual who is either female or female identified, non-binary, pretty much anyone other than um, like a cisgendered male. Um, and it was this person that approached you and said, listen, I've had my hand in a lot of startups. Um, I've kind of gotten a taste for it. I think I can do these things. I've got my own niche. I've got my own flavor. I've set up this technique. I think it's going to go really well. Um, I'm just getting ready to launch with a really good friend of mine. What are the top three pieces of advice that you would give that individual knowing what you know now? Yeah. Um, launch fast. Um, nice. Have a timeline. And um, have that timeline be three months, less than three months, and then define what success means in three months. Um, and oftentimes it's just getting X amount of emails or X amount of sales. Um, because oftentimes, you know, we can do this and build this and it will be one year later. Um, <laughs> and yeah. you to, but get your branding solidified. Um, and then the other piece is build community um, right away. Um, don't mm -hmm. wait until you have your perfect formula, your perfect product. Um, if you think you have a benefit you can offer someone, um, start building the community um, and uh, keep them involved. Let them in to see behind the scenes of all the thinking and don't be afraid to share that to the world. Um, if someone can copy you and launch faster, that's a bigger problem. You're not going fast enough. I love that. Um, I can't remember who it is right now. Oh, it's either LinkedIn or maybe it was um, Twitter. There's who says um, move quickly and break things. Oh, it's man. there. Right, right. Oh, man. It's, uh, it's one of the big kids um, in Silicon Valley, but um, they, they, their motto for a long time, I'm sure they've changed it, but oh, this yeah. was back in the day when QA was like, yeah. uh, everyone was like buddy programming and being psychotic so about their code. Yeah, and it was like, move quickly and break things. And I love that because it flipped <laughs> it on its head to be mm -hmm. kind of like, if you're too scared, if you're too tenuous, you'll lose some of the creative genius that comes out in just that free flowing format. Mm -hmm. And it treated um, software development as, as an art, which I think it, it, it is in its finest format. And so a lot of what you're saying here reminds me of that to, the, to a, a great complimentary degree. <laughs> but so what I have here is launch fast, have a timeline that's less than three, men, three months and de define what success means within those three month timelines. And the last one is build community right away. Yeah. I love those. Those are so awesome. And they're so applicable to, I think, every single field out there that I can imagine. Yeah. Um, I think that's so cool. Thank you so much for speaking with us today, Eva. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate your time. Yeah. Thank you, Patricia. Absolutely. And to everyone um, who's listening, we've been speaking with Eva Chan. You can find her. She's the co-founder of Launch Pop, which you can find online at www.launchpop.com. Um, and until we speak again next time, thank you for giving me your time and remember to stay in and stay safe until the regulations are lifted. And also remember to always bet on yourself. Slunch it.